Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala sayyidina wa nabiyina abil qasim Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Wa salatu wa salam ala ahli bayta tayyibina tahirina ma'asumin la siyama maulana wa sayyidi sahab al-asi wa zaman ruhi wa arwahu la alameen lahu al-fidah. وأجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف ولانة دائمة على أعدائهم ومنكر فذائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين ما بر بشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحلو لقطة من لساني يفقه كولي. Continuing on in our discussion on Surah Luqman again this evening from chapter number thirty-one of the Noble Quran, I wanted to look at two of the verses today, verses number eight and number nine, and it'll be a very quick review of these two verses. Uh, because once we get past this uh, introduction of Surah Luqman, inshallah, in our next uh, next session, we'll be looking at the actual advice of Surah of, of Luqman to his son. Um, so these are sort of more of the preliminary discussions that Allah has been going through in this chapter. Although, obviously, I'm sure that there has been a lot of things that we've been uh, picking up in terms of the themes and the content of the previous verses. But in this section today, in the very first verse, verse number 8, Allah is going to show us uh, a group of his blessings, things that Allah has given to us as human beings, things that are out there in the world today that you and I make use of or sometimes don't even use maybe on a regular basis, but they are classified and considered as uh, you know, blessings, as mercies from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the verse begins by saying that it is Allah khalaka samawati bi ghayri amadin tarawnaha that the world of creation, everything that Allah has put in, the very first thing that Allah speaks about as um, a manifestation of His blessings, of His bounties upon us, of these physical treasures that we have, He says He, he, says he created, or it's the creation of the heavens with pillars that we cannot see. Right? So obviously there's uh, a, a more, the more so the religious discussion on it, um, and also, you know, a scientific discussion of what does Allah mean, the creation of the heavens. The heavens meaning here, and, and usually this is a, a, a difficult world, word to translate. Samawat is the way that the commentators define it, is everything outside of the human atmosphere, out of the earthly atmosphere. So usually it's translated as heavens or the skies or the canopies above us. In, in some other translations we see that as the canopies. But the way that our scholars define samawat, or you know, we'll see in the Quran, sab'a samawat, the seven skies or the seven heavens, is, and this is also, I believe, in Surah Al-Mulk, this discussion comes forth, is that the scholars say from their understanding, the first, the first sky of these seven levels is the atmosphere of the earth, and whatever is within our um, grasp of understanding and seeing. Right? So if that is the definition of what we can see with our naked eyes, you know, the stars, the constellations, the planets, if that's the first sky or the first heaven, the hadith say, and, and well, the Quran rather, it says that there are seven of these. Right? And, so, and also keeping in mind that even the word, number seven used in the Quran and used in generally in within the context of Islamic discussion of the hadith, it doesn't always mean literally the number seven, right? Seven, seventy, number forty. A lot of these numbers used in the Islamic tradition are used for for multiplicity, not necessarily limited to that number. But if we take it as limited to the number seven, then what we see with our eyes at nighttime when we go out, that that is only the first level of the heavens. And so Allah says that He has created the samawat with these pillars that we cannot see. So everything as we know, and maybe this is in relation to gravity or something, but everything is moving, everything has its own orbit, everything is in a structure that Allah has put into place, and we don't see those pillars as Allah refers to them as, but yet things are moving, and things are basically being held up in some uh, fashion, obviously, which is beyond our understanding and our comprehension. From here, the second thing Allah tells us is, He says, وَأَلْقَى فِي الْأَرْضِ that he has cast firm mountains on the earth, lest it should shake with us. So this is another of the blessings that Allah gives us, is these mountains that we have. And we are just four or five hours away from actually experiencing what these mountains are. And you know, when you go to those, you know, somebody who 
maybe thinks a lot about themselves, of having pride and arrogance, and you stand at the base of a mountain, and you look at how grand and how lofty a mountain is, you realize how insignificant we as human beings are upon this earth. right? And you realize that, as the Quran says, that before the Day of Judgment, that these same mountains that we go to today and we take selfies of, that these same mountains before the Day of Judgment will crumble into dust. Right? And, so, and to realize and to look at the grandeur and the majesty of what Allah has put out there, and to realize that one day all of this will be annihilated. Right? Just looking at that mountain should bring us into a level of humbleness and humility. And obviously this verse in itself has obviously an, another scientific understanding to it. I don't want to go into a lot of the specifics tonight. But Allah shows us that these mountains and other verses in the Quran tell us that mountains are like pegs in the earth. That it maybe doesn't prevent earth from shaking completely, but there is some scientific, uh, some you know, natural phenomenon or blessing through having these mountains upon the earth. The third blessing Allah says, He says, وَبَثَّ فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّ دَعْبَةٍ that he has scattered in the earth, in it, on the earth, every kind of animal. Right? And we know that when we look at nature, you look at whether you go to, you know, out in the mountains or you watch any of these nature television shows, how you see so many kinds of animals on the earth and in the water. And you know, when you look at some of these documentaries, they tell us that there are still thousands of species which have not been discovered yet both on earth, in the jungles, in the rainforests, in, in the deserts, and also under the oceans, that there are animals, uh, you know, fish, amphibians, different creatures that we have never heard about, and some of them which only up until recent we've actually seen live footage of. You know, I remember reading on one of these, or seeing one of these documentaries, that I believe it was the giant squid, and up until maybe about five to eight years ago, we never had actual video footage of this giant squid in its natural habitat, right? So for hundreds of thousands of years, hundreds of years maybe, we knew it existed. Maybe people had seen it, maybe, you know, after it was killed or something, but we had never actually had live footage of this particular cre creation of Allah. And so what we know and what we see is obviously, you know, what has been discovered by the scientists and by humanity. But there is obviously much more that we will perhaps maybe never discover that it's out there that Allah has put on this earth. And then Allah says, وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً That we send down water from the sky. And obviously this is one of the most important blessings of Allah, is having this rain. It irrigates, it irrigates our crops. It gives life to the dead earth as the Quran tells us. We drink from the water. We make, you know, we make so many uses out of water that this is one of the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has conferred upon us. And obviously like all of His blessings, we are charged with maintaining it, preserving it, taking care of it. You know, even when we look at the topic about israf, about wastage, in relation to water. You know, unfortunately when we look at it, when you look at how Muslims, for example, make wudu, sometimes you go to the sinks and the bathrooms and you think that maybe there was a flood in the bathroom. There's so much water wasted. But Rasulullah showed us that even with a small glass of water, maybe a 10 or 12 ounce glass in our terms today, you can make a full complete wudu. And to show you how important it is not to waste, there's even a hadith from Rasulullah where one of the companions one time was making wudu and he was using excessive water. And he asked the Messenger of Allah, he says, O Messenger of God, what if I'm at the foot of a bank of a river and I use excess water? And even there, Rasulullah said, even if you're at the bank of a river and you use excess water to make wudu, you've done israf. You've committed a sin. Right? So we don't just look at it, well, I only, you know, I have a river in front of me or a whole swimming pool. I can just, you know, easily make wudu and waste as much water because it goes back into it. No, the Prophet was training his companions and training us that we always have to just use the minimal of what we need. Even if we're at the bank of the ocean, if we're at the Pacific Ocean, and there's thousands and obviously millions, if not billions of gallons of water in the ocean, still there's no room for us to do israf and waste more than we need, even in that particular circumstance. And the fifth and the last blessing Allah mentions in this particular passage, 
He says, فَأَنْبَتْنَا فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّ زَوْجٍ كَرِيمٍ And he has caused every splendid, every noble kind of plant to grow in it. And we just think about ourselves, and especially in the summer season, although for us, because we get fruits and vegetables year around, we don't have to worry about seasons and you know fruit not being available. But you just think about it when you go into the supermarket and you see the, you know, the 15 kinds of apples and multiple kinds of oranges and mangoes and all of these fruits and all of the vegetables and all of the plants that are out there. And these are all blessings that Allah has given to us. The fruit that we go, the fruit that we grow, the fruit that we eat, these are all things that Allah has put on the earth for your and my usage. And so obviously these are all things that we have to take into account to think about when it comes to Allah Himself and why we show thanks to Him and how we acknowledge Him as the Creator. Let me go to some of the points that we can learn from this particular verse before we go to the next verse. The one thing that we learn is that just because we cannot see something, it doesn't mean that we don't believe in it or that it doesn't exist. Right? Allah tells us right in the beginning of the Quran in Surah Baqarah, after Alif La Mim, He says what? ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهُ دَلِّ الْمُتَّقِينَ That that book, the Quran, is a book in which there is no doubt, and it is a guidance for those who have taqwa. And then He describes those of taqwa by saying, أَلَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ those who have firm belief in the unseen, right? Not only is Allah unseen, we believe in Him. The angels are unseen, we believe in them. There are so many things which are not visible by our eyes, but yet we are told to believe in it. You know, when, when you look at the human being and we study the creation of us as humans, we realize how insignificant and how deficient we are compared to other creations. You know, for example, as humans, we have a limited range of hearing from 20 hertz to 20 megahertz, I believe it is, right? Or 20,000 hertz. So it's a very limited frame. But yet we know that there are sounds that animals can hear that we can't. So, for example, dogs can hear at a higher frequency or lower than we can. But we don't have that ability. Our eyesight might be good. We might have 20-20 vision when we go to the doctor. But there are birds that can see kilometers away. Right? So they have a much piercing vision than we have. Right? So the point of this is, is that there are so many things that we are, that are you know, beyond our scope of sight, of hearing, of, of you know, even grasping from the, from, the, from the science point of view. But that doesn't mean that just because science can't quantify it or measure it that we don't accept it and we reject it. No, we have to say that these things exist even though we can't recognize them. And just like Allah, we don't see Allah, we don't hear Allah, we don't, you know, we don't perceive Allah with any of our senses, but yet we still believe in Him. We still say He exists, even though we can't you know, pinpoint Him as we can do with a physical object in front of us. Another point we learn from this is that before anything in our life, that there has to be peace and tranquility in our life. And this goes for everything. You can't expect a person to submit to Allah, to have the mind, to have the focus and the ability to worship Allah if they're not having or living a life of peace and tranquility. People who are suffering in war-torn countries, for example, or people who are going to sleep hungry, young children, adults who don't have food to eat. How do we expect them to lead a life of peace and tranquility when, or you know, how do they expect them to submit to Allah when they don't have that peace and tranquility within their lives? And so Allah shows us that He has put all of these things, the mountains, the animals, the food, all of these things are there to give us stability in our lives. And when we don't have those things, then obviously our life can be turned upside down at the blink of an instant. We also learn from this verse that this order which rules on earth and in the entire you know, universe is there for us to be able to live and exist. You know, and again, you look at the, at the documentaries about Earth, and you'll see that you know, even the exact position where Earth is in relation to the sun and the moon, if the Earth was you know, a couple kilometers closer or further away, they say that life would not be able to exist. Either everything would be burnt, or everything would be frozen. Right? And there's so many more things that the scientists talk about. So everything that is the way that the earth is situated in the solar system and the way that everything is moving and rotating and all these 
everything how it is in the system is basically put there not by chance, not by just some random coincidence in the universe, but no, we believe that this was thereby designed by Allah. He put it in place for you and I to live on this earth and that there is obviously a purpose for all of this, all of these creatures, creatures and creations that are on this earth. We also see that point number four is that water is one of the greatest blessings that we have and one of the utmost important things that Allah has given to us. The Quran tells us in other verse that Allah has created every living thing out of water. Right? So we know that, that life comes from water and water is something which gives us life. When the earth dies in the winter time and spring season comes, then that water which is used to you know, grow the plants and the trees and the flowers, that is that water that we need. You can't pour milk on a plant or on the crops and expect the crops to grow. And so as even our scholars mentioned that when it comes to water, that we have to obviously be very careful of its usage. You know, unfortunately, we live in a society where we just turn the tap on and we get fresh water. But were we to have to live in a third world country, or even not even a third world country, look at what happened in Fort McMurray, where they're told to bring their own water because they're not allowed to use the tap water, right? So just us having the blessing of going into the bathroom or the kitchen, opening a tap and having clean, pure water come out of it, that in itself is one of the greatest blessings that we could ever be given by Allah, that we should never take for granted or waste or use in an excessive fashion. And the fifth point from this verse is that when it comes to everything else in creation, the plants, the animal kingdom, we have to consider those things as being ennobled, as having kiramat. As Allah says that He has created everything min, min kulli zawjin kareem. Right? So we not only do we give that respect, but we have to you know, show honor to these things. And that goes back to that discussion of you know, when we look at the Islamic traditions, of how to treat animals, of how to treat plants, you know. We're not allowed to kill animals for fun. In Islam, there's no such thing as sport hunting or sport fishing, you know. It's not allowed to just go and kill ants, for example, just because you want to. You can't kill a bird just because you don't like the nest, for example. These are all prohibitions in Islam. And even when it comes to, you know, Things that we grow, trees, even, we, even there we have traditions from the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt where even when it comes to times of war and defense, he prohibited us from chopping down trees, from polluting the water, from you know, doing all of these actions which unfortunately we see sometimes happening in the world around us at times of war. So all of these things have been ennobled, they have a kiramat, they have a status to them that Allah has given to them. Out of, the, out of the fact that Allah has put all of these things on earth for you and I to make use of and to benefit from. The next verse, and we'll end with this, mentions where Allah says, Hada khalqullah, that this is the creation of God. This is God's creation for us. فَأَرُونِي مَاذَا خَلَقَ الَّذِينَ مِن دُونِهِ Now show me what others besides Him have created. Allah is putting forth a uh, you know, uh, this rhetorical question that this is what Allah has done, this is what God has done. Now those who deny God, show me what your gods, what your things have done. And then Allah says, fi mubin. However, these wrongdoers who reject God, who reject this divine hand in creation, Allah says that they are in a manifest, in a clear error. And obviously when we look at it, and again, I don't want to go into too much detail. My, my time is really running up right now. But when you look at even the discussions that Muslims or people of any religion will have with atheists, and you know, the, 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 the debates that go back and forth, and it's not only in today's day and age. You know, even the time of the prophet and imams, people who were completely deniers of God, they would come and debate the prophets. They would come and debate our imams. And there are books which these debates are recorded in that are available. And we can see how the Imams gave logical explanations and arguments to explain to these individuals the, the, you know, the necessity to have a creator and that this you know, evolution as they believe it today could not have come into, into being. That things cannot just happen out of random chance. Right? So and these are things that if, obviously if we're interested we can study on our own. 
But just to show that there are responses given by the Imams of Ahlul Bayt wassalam, to answer these kinds of questions that may come into our minds of all of these things in creation. Let me end with a few points of interest from this last verse that we can take home with us and think about. And there are also practical things that we should be able to use in our lives when the time, when, you know, when time is there and when time is needed to actually enter into such things. The first thing that we see is that when we're talking to other people, you know, obviously non-Muslims, non-believers, that we should start by explaining our path and what we believe and what Islam is all about. And then if we're debating somebody else, let's ask them to provide their arguments. Right? Allah says, Hada khalqullah, that this is the creation of Allah. Mean that when we enter into discussions, we should present our arguments with our logic, with our wisdom, with our proofs, and then ask the other side to counter those debates, counter those points. So this is one of the first things that we can gain from this sort of a verse. Another thing we see is that one of the ways of knowing Allah, actually getting, have, having this ma'rifat, knowledge of Allah, is to draw this comparison between His power and the power of others. Right? As Allah says that this is the creation of Allah, now tell me what your gods can do. Right? Your gods who have no ability, who are just, for example, statues in, 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 a, in a room, in a case. What power do these gods, so-called gods that you worship, what power do they have? And so we are also at a level as believers can better know Allah by studying the universe. You know, even Allah tells us in the Quran that He will manifest His signs in the universe and also within you and I as human beings. Right? And so this becomes a way for us to better know Allah, to better know our Creator by studying the world of existence within us and also in the outside world. A third point that we learn from this verse is that as Muslims, we should never just accept things as hearsay. You know, people say something to us and we accept it right away, you know, with blind faith. No, as, the, as, the, as we're told that we have to always ask for proof and evidence. As Allah tells us in the Quran, Kul hatu burhanakum in kuntum sadiqeen. Bring your proof if you are truthful. Somebody tells you something, don't just blindly accept it because he's a good person. Right? Always have some proof. Somebody gives a hadith. Somebody says a verse of the Quran. Somebody says that this marja says this opinion. Yes, maybe we, we're not going to say that they're lying, but at the same time, to make a statement means that you should have proof to back yourself up. And so Allah shows us not only here, but many times in the Quran, that the onus is on the person making a statement. That it's up to them to have to prove the truthfulness of their word by bringing forth their documented, documented evidence. And last but not least in these last few points, Allah shows us that any form of stubbornness, any show of you know, being opposed to accepting the truth, that Allah refers to this as dhulam on the self. As it says, bali zalimun. Right? So not only is dhulam when you do something to somebody else, but even a person who rejects Allah, a person who rejects a, a, you know, even a commandment within Islam, once they understand it to be a, a part of Islamic legislation, they're considered as being a dhalim, one who's been you know, unjust to their own souls. And even in Dua Kumail, we say this, dhalam tu nafsi. Right? We repeat this line in Dua Kumail, that I have been unfair to my own self. And obviously that is one of the greatest forms of injustice that a person can do is on their own self, to actually be unfair to their own akhirat, their own world to come. And last but not least, that those who go in search of other than God, we are told are not only are they misguided and misled, but again, they're also unjust to their own souls. As Allah says, بَلِ الظَّالِمُونَ فِي ذَلَالِ And the final point we'll end with this is that misguidedness of poly, the, the misguidedness rather of polytheism is not hidden as Allah calls it dhalalim mubin it is an open misguidedness right it's clear when you see what those people believe that this doesn't make sense it's not a logical understanding of the creator and the creation of the universe we close and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we continue in this blessed month of Ramadan that he give us the ability to continue to fast during the days to stand for worship in the night and we ask Allah to accept these fasts and prayers and supplications and recitation of Quran. 
And we ask Allah to give the thawab, the, re the reward of this program this evening to the souls of all of those who have left this community, to our family members who have left this world, to our friends, to the ulama who have, who have passed away into the shuhada. Let us close by reciting one surah fatiha for their thawab, but before that one salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim.